Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ad Week webinar, uh, where we will be examining ways that you can provide more effective multicultural insights. Uh, and it's the ways that you can accelerate your segmentation through cultural nuances and sensitivities. Uh, and our webinar today is being sponsored by Resonate. Uh, I'm Stuart File, uh, Vice President of Branded Content over at Ad Week. Uh, and I am going to be your host for today's webinar. Uh, before I begin, um, before we begin the webinar, I'm just going to take a few minutes here, make sure that everyone knows what to expect from our presentation, uh, and also to make sure that everyone is familiar with the features of our webinar platform. Uh, our presentation today should go somewhere in the 30, 35 minute range. Uh, afterwards, we're going to have plenty of time for audience Q&A, uh, and I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions on this one. So if at any point during our presentation, if you have a question for our speakers, uh, just simply use the question tool that you see there on the left side of your screen, and we're going to get to as many audience questions as we can following our live presentation. Um, it's not too late to invite your colleagues to join us today, uh, and we would really love it if they would. Uh, but make it easier for you, about 15 minutes ago, we sent everyone a final reminder email for today's webinar. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in there, you will find a link over to the registration page. So grab that link, send it off to your colleagues, slack it to them, email it to them, whatever, whatever format you're using. Uh, there's still plenty of time for them to register and join us live. But if they can't make it live, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand. And we're going to send a link to that on-demand version uh, to everyone later this afternoon. So check your email about 3.30 Eastern time today. Uh, you'll get that link. Uh, if you're interested in getting a PDF of today's slide deck, uh, and we know people often want those. It's a great way to refer back to some of the, uh, the learnings that are being shared. Uh, you can get a PDF of the slides right now from the event resources tab that you see there at the top of your screen. So uh, go on in there. You're welcome to download the PDF at any time. And certainly feel free to share those with your colleagues as well. Uh, lastly, uh, I just want to invite everyone to please check out the Ad Week webinar calendar, www.adweek.com slash webinars. Uh, we've got a full calendar of webinars coming up. Uh, we're doing, well, five this week. We've got four next week, uh, including another one from our sponsor, Resonate. So uh, go to adweek.com slash webinars, see what's coming up, sign up for one of the upcoming webinars including the Resonate one or whatever really uh, interests you. Uh, you'll also get access to our full archive of on-demand webinars. Uh, and that's every webinar that we've done over the past 12 months. Uh, all, they're all recorded and available to you there. Uh, again, our, our sponsor Resonate has one. Uh, they did it earlier this year. Really interesting stuff. Uh, look for that one, but look for other things that interest you. Adweek.com slash webinars. So let's move on to today's webinar. And let me just take a second here and introduce our speakers. Uh, first off, we our guest speaker uh, from Alma, uh, certainly the, one of the top multicultural agencies out there. Uh, we have Angela Rodriguez, who's the VP and Head of Strategy. Uh, really, uh, she heads uh, Alma's, Alma's Strategic Planning and Insights Department. Uh, she's responsible for leading research development of consumer insights creation of inspiring creative strategies, execution of post-campaign analytics for, uh, for the agency's roster of brands. Uh, she's just really a, a great speaker uh, on, on all these things. I know she's also been a contributor to Ad Week on occasion as well. Uh, we're also joined today by Erica McCoy. Erica is the CMO over at Resonate. Uh, she's a global marketing executive experienced in building brands, facilitating growth and driving revenue in high-tech telecom, manufacturing, energy, hospitality uh, across North America, Europe, and Asia. So that's with seemingly every vertical on every continent. Uh, so Erica and Angela, uh, I want to welcome you both. Uh, and Erica, let me pass this on over to you to start our webinar today. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it does sort of read like that, doesn't it? And, and really, 
I don't even look like that anymore, right? It's 2020. So <laughs> I probably need to update that, uh, that headshot as well. It would look a little bit more frayed, um, probably a little bit more head in the hair in a messy bun, right? I'm sure everybody um, has, has had one heck of a year in 2020. And when I think about what 2020 looks like, it, this to me is, the, is sort of the vantage point. I mean, as consumers, I think you're just trying to get through whatever turmoil you are thrown into. And as marketers, and agencies, brand marketers, we're really, we are, we are always kind of waiting for this next big wave to come. How do we address consumers in a way that's both empathetic and compassionate? How do we get our businesses back on track? How do we drive sales during a time of so much you know, tumultuousness? And so, you know, 2020, what else, what can be said here? What we learned in 2020 is a couple of things. One, speed matters. You have to be able to respond quickly to everything that's happening and to respond in a way that is meaningful. And to do that, you need data. Um, we've already, we're on a trend of moving to data-driven marketers, right? Most of us have made that pivot, but speed and data go hand in hand for 2020. And when it comes to data, freshness matters. Um, I think we all know when we when we order right to get our salads from the salads from from DoorDash as we will do today or or what, however we're going to order them, freshness in your data is really really critical. So an old data, a study from January, a study from March, um, you know strict demographic data, you can't compare what you had to what you need today. It's got to be fresh data, updated segments, right? Refresh your segmentation strategy. And, and really an updated understanding of who your customers and potential customers are. And in 2020, connectivity matters. That means your insights have to drive action. You can't have insights that sit siloed, a study that was done that sits siloed somewhere in your organization that's not connected to your ability to take action, whether that is to evolve your product line, to offer a new service as a, at, at a bank, or a new service in a retail experience, right? Or, or even changing your advertising, your creative, that connection between your data and your ability to execute on it is critical. And localization matters, right? There are trends that are happening in certain areas that are different than other areas, different regions reacting differently, different DMAs, like down at that level where turmoil might be happening, your ability to have localized understanding and localized response and localized action is really, really critical. And of course, personalization matters more than ever in 2020. And so, you know, many of us as marketers remember the time and maybe are still experiencing a time where we talk about, you know, suburban moms on the move, um, you know, demographic Hispanic, uh, age 25 to 35, female, two children in the household, right? These types of flat personas um, just don't cut it anymore because there are differences in, in these moms, right? We could have the same mom, the same ethnic background, the same age, the same household income, and have two completely different audiences. And what is your ability to discern between the, the mom who has two twin two-year-old children and the mom who has a five and a six-year-old child, one with more low discretionary income compared to high discretionary income, whether they're in the market to buy an appliance, whether or not they're Amazon Prime shopper, whether or not they have valuing, you know, nature and, and caring for their community or whether financial stability and investing is a priority for them. Uh, you know, are they cord cutters? What, what newspaper do they read? Do they care about school being safety or more about school vouchers, right? There's just so many nuances. So personalization really, really matters. And we've been keeping up with these consumers. So not only do we keep up with the consumers in date regular life, if, if such a thing even exists anymore, but we keeping, we're keeping up with consumers in crisis. And this chart is just showing when we looked at the number of cases um, that, we're, that were COVID-19 cases that we're seeing here in the United States, um, and, and we are, have expanded the number of surveys that we're doing. So we have basically been in market surveying consumers to understand how their sentiment is changing about all the things that you care about, why they buy, where they buy, how they buy, if they're going to buy, what is driving their decision to buy. And we've observed some really amazing things as we look at trends over time. And we have now moved from just COVID-19 research into recent events, including social um, injustice and other topics that have been permeating the headlines 
We have more than a thousand data elements on just these topics alone. And so sharing some of this trending data um, just to give you some insights to where people are progressing. When we ask the question about um, to what extent are you concerned about the economic related consequences of coronavirus situation, you can see over time how people who were at extremely large extent, right, that dark blue line, started up at 31% and how it dipped down. And you guys can remember, come on the journey with me when we maybe Memorial Day and you started to think, oh my gosh, we might actually have some normal here. And people started going on a Memorial Day and we saw those pictures and we started to be panicked as, as the, the virus started to spread, right? You can see where that moment of inflection came around June where all of a sudden we had hit a bottom where people were saying they were not that concerned, but then right back up. And, and this is the first time, our, our most recent wave, in fact, we'll have another wave updated this week, but our most recent wave is finally showing a leveling off here as people start to come to terms with, okay, I'm, I'm calming down my expectations a little bit. I am not as in much in a panic mode. But we can tell you these trends over time and who these people are. When we ask the question about normal, and, and I think it's become a joke, right, but our personal normal feels like never, I like to say, um, or never is the new normal is my other favorite. Black is the new black is my other favorite one. I, don't, I, I know <laughs> black is definitely a staple for me in the, in the closet, but normal is really something that people are uh, re rethinking. And so you can see here when we thought about when do you think normal will happen, people are now solidly thinking, okay, it's a year. Pretty much everyone has wrapped their heads around it's going to take more than a year to get to this return to normal. And we still have 8.5% of people, you know, it's been, it's been up and it's been down. We maxed out almost 11% of people saying never, never will we return to normal. And obviously one of the big concerns is economic concerns. And, and we not only do we ask globally what you feel about your, the economy and the U.S. economy, but what about your own personal economic situation? How do you feel about your personal situation? And what we found is that only 27% are reporting that they are living comfortably, meaning that they are saying they're more than able to pay for necessities and they have a cushion of money in reserve. That means that we've got you know, 50% basically saying they're just getting by, they're able to pay, maybe there's a little bit left over. So there is definitely a sense of how do I feel um, about my own personal finance? And we've noticed that there is a tendency to now increase people's desire to monitor budgets and be much, much more diligent about their budgets. So 36% are people are reporting, I am now paying a lot more attention to how I'm budgeting and my expenses. And when we look at how they break down, we can see the, even what economic breakdown are they at. So what income level, about the majority of them are, are at the 25 to 50% um, level, but the big bulk are the people that are right in the middle, the 50 to 75% um, percent how, um, thousand household income, about 27% more likely than the rest of the, the U.S. to worry about this budgeting. And so that, that followed very closely by the 75 to 100 percent, 100K household income. Again, looking very closely at their budget, and as we enter the holiday season, it's very important to understand this and how it's trending, right? And so we're continuing to ask that question. We'll have it updated. But even more importantly, we really need to understand the nuances within audiences and even within sub-audiences. And so since we're talking multicultural today, I wanted to take a look in our platform about the Hispanic audiences and how they're responding specifically to um, financial concerns when it comes to COVID-19. And so we looked at a variety of ethnic um, Hispanic descents, Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, and a mix of other Latino, Latino descents. And we can see here, when we look at things like, am I personally concerned about economic loss? Definitely trends are showing that in Mexican descent and other like kind of multi background descent, well above average feeling concerned, certainly more concerned than the other two. And when we look at things like planning to decrease their spending, we see even more nuances. So when we look at those who are in the in the sort of other category or compared to those that are in the um, either Cuban or Mexican, the folks in the other category are 87% more likely to be looking to decrease their spending. That's not necessarily the case for Cuban descent. So those in, the, in, 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 in highly dense um, Cuban areas where you're targeting Cuban, Hispanic Americans, like very, very important nuances to understand, even within large backgrounds of, of folks. And when we lastly look at people that are concerned about declaring bankruptcy, 
you can see also a big, a big change between people, Cuban descent, not as worried. Um, other, you know, significantly 69% more worried. And even those in the back, right, worried, Oop, I skipped ahead a little too quickly, even right here between Mexican and Puerto Rican, certainly above average, concerned about having to declare bankruptcy. And so very interesting nuances existing in within the data. And we also see responses differently. So when we um, ran a segmentation study on, on the U.S. population, we broke it into four categories um, of people that are ready to go back um, and, and those that are not. So we looked at everything from the reopen resistant audience, which you'll see here, to reopen rushers, we call them. We really like alliteration um, at Resonate, and, and maybe you could figure out why, but we, we have a lot of R's here. But when we look at the differences here, within, again, within our subcategories of those of Hispanic descent, we see a really big difference in people that are ready to go back. Um, Mexican Americans reporting 21% more likely to be ready to go back. Very, very different when you look at Puerto Rican and Cuban descent, completely not in the rusher category at all. So really big differences that make a really big difference in how you respond to your customers and how you engage them during very complicated, turbulent times. So how do we know all of this? I think it's always good to just sort of explain that we have AI-based consumer intelligence grounded in the real world. And by that, I mean we start with humans. And those humans take the largest U.S. national consumer study. And when they fill that out, they basically are telling us what, what they're, what, they're, what. What we then do is observe, right, what they actually do. So what you tell me and what I see you do combined and then take into scale as if the entire U.S. population then filled out this continuously updated survey. And using machine learning and AI, we're basically able to model every single response. And what that gets us is what we call the human element at scale. So there's an ongoing survey where we have 200,000 responses that are refreshed every six to eight weeks prior to COVID and every two to three weeks with COVID and social and other recent events. That yields us 200 million profiles, each that have 13,000 data points associated to them. And so if you're a brand or you're an agency, you wanna bring, you can actually onboard your own data and understand these 13,000 elements about that. So this is this continuous AI-based research. That's how we understand it. And for us, it's always about understanding the evolving humans. We, we're always focused on knowing individuals and believing that a brand's ability to have a long-term relationship that drives customer lifetime value comes from knowing people well. And we are all very, very different, just as we've shown today. Now, I'm happy to share with you a, an agency that understands the nuances between humans better than any other, multicultural leader Alma, and I'm gonna turn it over to Angela. Thanks, Erica. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Alma means soul in Spanish, and our name comes from the belief that brands, in order to be relevant, should find their soul as a path to connect to people's hearts and emotions drive that connection. At Alma, we are leaders in the multicultural marketing space, specifically um, with the power of insight, creativity, and influence. At Alma, we do have Hispanic segment marketing as our DNA, but we do much more than that. And we consider ourselves, to, we consider our strategic competency to actually be segmentation and cultural understanding. And Resonate is a great partner for us in being able to do that better than ever. Our approach to understanding the apertures of unique segments to drive business growth are what sets us apart. And our strategic philosophy is that specificity drives authenticity, those nuances that Erica was just talking about. While universal truths may often apply, the data landscape today allows us to dig deeper into nuance than ever. And those nuances are compelling to both the individuals that they most apply to, as well as to their peers. In the past few years, Several pieces of research have confirmed this, and the most compelling of all was the ANA's AIM SIM study that found that ads perceived with high versus low cultural relevance increased brand perception 2x and ad effectiveness by a factor of three. Now, this was true for all audiences as well as cross-culturally. In fact, the worst performing creative for any segment, including the general audience, was the work that was intended to be universal. So marketers talk about the importance of being customer-obsessed, and we agree. 
who people are at their core is the starting point for us at Alma for every project. And not just who they are, but how is their identity shaping their behavior. To better understand Hispanics in particular, we created our proprietary segmentation model that we call Alma CID. Now, when we first launched this model in 2008, it was a game changer. At the time, no one was talking about bicultural Hispanics. These are the Hispanics who we identified as having an identity that is both 100% Latino and 100% American. When we updated this segmentation in 2018, we changed the game again by showing how Hispanics had evolved, demonstrating the many ways that their self-perceptions, beliefs, and attitudes had shifted, changed, or been reinforced in that time. And most especially, we found that there was a big shift in how Hispanics in America are living, moving more strongly away from assimilation and towards increased retention of their culture. And our segmentation model, I'm gonna show you uh, two very simplified slides. Usually uh, it would take about an hour to walk through the whole thing. But this evolved approach is really about being culture driven and not language based. We map the intersection of affinity towards each of the cultures that Hispanic Americans live and experience every day. And we found um, in combination with a plethora of other attitudes, beliefs and behaviors that these three segments are segments through which brands can leverage and enable genuine connections uh, because of the cultural understanding. So a little bit more extremely high level about these segments is um, shown here. So preservers and fusionistas share this idea that they have very high Hispanic cultural affinity. Preservers are preserving their culture daily through rituals and important occasions, and fusionistas are living that 200% dual affinity life. They are foundationally self-identified as Latinos, but they move very fluidly in U.S. culture. American embracers, on the other hand, have a much higher American affinity. They're immersed in U.S. customs and lifestyles, and they have a much more individualistic and progressive mindset, more in tune with those American sides of them. However, there are moments where they are very much Hispanic. And Resonate helps us deepen that behavioral understanding. In the 10 years between our releases of our cultural segmentation, a lot changed in the media and data landscape. We were really looking to understand how to better understand our segments. We wanted to better understand how they behaved and to see them through the media world and, and where we could find them. So we had been on this effort to really understand um, them better. We tried a lot of different tools and eventually about a year ago, we landed on Resonate. And what we have found is that it has the best ability um, that we've seen to parse out and deepen that behavior understanding of ethnic segments, not just Hispanics, but all ethnics. Using it, we've been able to model our CID segments within it and deepen our consumer understanding for Hispanics. This helps us shape briefs that power the creative solutions that we develop for our clients. But first, we really had to validate what was out there. We built out our segments in the system, and there were kind of two key points that helped us uh, feel really good about the data. The first point was the personal values. The personal values really reflected what we know to be true of each of the segments. For preservers, we found humility, conformity, and tradition as the top values, which makes sense because they're the most Latino um, group, and those are the core Hispanic values. For fusionistas, we found this blend of values, right, of personal values uh, between independence and authority and um, really that balance between modern American and traditional Hispanic. And for American embracers, they li uh, leaned very much towards the more independent-minded American values of influence and achievement um, and tolerance, interestingly. One of the other kind of key validators for us was when we saw purchase uh, preferences. Again, they were very much in line with what we would expect. We needed to make sure that what we expected and what the tool gave us were in line. And we found that preservers and fusionistas were behaving similarly to each other and buying uh, products that were very popular. Um, additionally, preservers tended to be very product, um, uh, wanted to purchase products that were produced sustainably, which is something that we know of, of people with strong ties to Latin American culture, and that they weren't purchasing products that were very healthy. Again, another thing we know when we think about wellness, when we think about food, uh, preservers don't tend to do that. And then we found that American embracers were looking for products that were best looking, again, very much in mind with the American uh, mindset. So what does that look like in action for us? I've got three case studies to show you how we do that on a daily basis. First, an example of how we were able to segment messaging better through better understanding. We looked at preservers in the wellness category who were older. They were 35 to 64. 
And our starting point was a qualitative understanding of who they were. We understood their collective attitudes towards health and wellness. We know that they were held back by many unhealthy aspects of that traditional diet. They face challenges with language and culture when visiting the doctor. And they have a strong preference for natural remedies and traditional medicines. When we overlaid that into Resonate, we were able to enrich our understanding at a market level to help refine messaging. And here's two areas that we looked like. We looked at San Antonio and Austin versus Miami. In both markets, we found that religion was very much a, a defining factor for who these people are and could give us that spirituality and guide our messaging in that way. However, there were some key differences. In the Texas markets, we found that hard work and charitable issues were other areas of opportunity that we could flex our messaging on, whereas in Miami family time, theme park, this idea of togetherness was really much more resonant. But it wasn't just the where and how to, or it wasn't just the what and to say, but the where and how to reach these people, right? When we looked at these oldest, older wellness seeking preservers, we found that in San Antonio and Austin, we should have a bilingual approach that was heavy on social and streaming, whereas in Miami, we really need to be Spanish first, heavy up on TV and radio. In our next example, it was really about unlocking opportunity. Where can we find an opportunity for higher ed fusionistas? So for bicultural Hispanics, what could we do and who could we speak to within the bicultural world? And what we found is that we could identify a segment of female betterment seekers. These were women who were um, between 18 and 24. They had a lower household income. They tried to get some college before, but they were still seeking much um, more in terms of their higher ed. Because they were in the mindset of higher education, their personal values shifted towards things that were driving them, like being in charge of others, showing their abilities and being admired and acquiring wealth and influence, which makes sense when we're thinking about the category. We found that they were fueled by optimism and self-expression and creativity as kind of key drivers and personality traits that were coming forth in, when they were considering higher ed moments and, and um, making those decisions. And also that they wanted to prove their competence and skills. We know that this group of women really want to be seen for their achievements. We know that they're increasingly the first gen to college. They're the first in their families to really start making these um, kind of white collar jobs and, and making kind of different purchase decisions because of higher incomes. And that's really shown in the data. We also uncovered their digital behaviors. We know that they're more connected, they're cord cutters, they're social butterflies who are frequently engaging on social media more often than others. And what Resonate was able to give us even beyond this was a more precise consumer journey. We were able to identify that there was a step in between awareness and consideration that we called informed awareness, where they shifted just from almost like browsing for opportunities and what they might do to actively searching for what's the real thing that they were going to do. What's that next step? What are my true options? So with the data that we were able to uncover and resonate, we created a more precise journey um, with more precise messaging to the barriers in each step. And here's some sample channel planning. We didn't really get into um, that for you guys today, but it, we couldn't have done it without the precision that we were able to find inside of Resonate for the fusionista woman who was in this higher ed mindset. Now for the last example, something a little bit more timely, we needed to have a real time understanding of what was happening in COVID. And that research that Erica showed you earlier was really core to us being able to identify what lovers of Latinx culture fusionistas and their friends were feeling as it related to heading back out into the world. So the starting point was a solid brand focus, a really um, strong strategy that we've been working with our client for some time that was suddenly called into question. The brand in, in this example is one that's associated with outdoor cried out occasions that Latinx culture lovers of all backgrounds enjoy. So this is Hispanics, fusionistas who are bicultural in particular, and their friends, people who are culturally open. And we wanted to know, will the strategy that we have to be in this moment still work after COVID? 
And the data helped us have a real-time understanding of the sentiment, which allowed us to make a very fast informed reco. As you can see here, the bars in blue are the fusionistas, the Hispanics in the category who like these kinds of moments, who like Latin culture, and their friends, the non-Latinx category users who also are culturally open. And for both, we saw this over-indexing being those reopened rushers, right, that they are already meeting people in the last week and that they are ready to go out into the world once they hear what others are doing. So this enduring eagerness for these social events and a sense that they'd be among the first to rush back to whatever normalcy is helped us make that timely decision to hold the strategy and be the brand they wanted to rush back to. So <clears throat> Angela, first of all, you, you've covered a ton of really great information here. And I, I love that even the nuance in this that you are as an agency helping and to guide this brand to make decisions in real time, right? So the data that you're showing on the slide, looking at not only are they in the category of a propensity to be a rusher, but they are also, you know, have met physically with people, right, in the last week more than 20 times. Like that's how specific the data can be that can guide your discussion. And so just like you know we're saying yesterday's data will not help you tomorrow it won't help you today either right so imagine the data that you're using imagine the insights that you had that we all started this year right with the best intentions and i know even my team like all the things that we thought we were going to accomplish this year before we had to throw out the playbook and restart and so that's why you need really agile decision making by understanding prospects and customers really a lot better. And so our goal is how do you understand and act in real time, whether it's about opening or closing banks or retail locations based on what's happening, or just even changing the experience that you have in certain retail locations because of what's needed in that particular region and the time that we're in. Um, making changes to the way that, you know, even services that you offer. Think about the emergence of um, curbside delivery, right? Some of those COVID-induced new services that were offered in retail are not going to go away. There's an expectation that's been set. But for whom and which, which segments and which regions and which of your priority, you know, is it your best customer segments that want that or is it your lower priority customer segments that want that? You know, that's the type of nuance you need to understand. What services and products should roll out in order to serve customers today, different than even March, right? Different than July. And then of course, you know, churn prevention is an enormous topic right now, as um, you know, especially in, in, in CPG and retail, and you think about um, people's shift in, in where they shop and how they shop. Um, and, and so understanding that creative messaging and your offers, even to get that wording just right, you know, so perfect, um, real data, real time so you can drive decisions. And so if you think about it, it's, decide, it's driving all parts of your business. And I think this is particularly difficult in large brands. As someone who comes from the brand space, you know, we are, have been set up in silos. And so silo data exists. Perhaps, you know, one organization, one channel is managed by a different team, the website managed differently by somebody else. The goal here is this holistic information can help you drive decision making across your organization whether it's you know insights that help drive foundational strategy um, brand actions um, and how you take on your brand values personas and segmentation and micro segmentation the products and services and things that we talked about even your campaign tactics and then some that we didn't focus on as much is really into execution how do you drive this into personalized website experience how do you drive this into your advertising channels and of course, how do you validate that what you're doing is right? And so that's really why we designed to have this all in a platform so you can do that. So at a glance, all this information is available to you tomorrow. When you log into this platform and you, you can begin to rebuild your personas, you can um, you know, begin to easily update um, your own insights, you can bring in your first party data. Again, we talked about how many people we have in our study, um, you know, always on. We have many, 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 um, you know, people, 200,000 people responding um, six, six to eight times a year we are in the market. We cover all different verticals, right? So there's tons more information we could cover, and we really want, we've got so many great questions. I know we wanted to give time for that. If you are an agency looking for more information about how to um, be a best-in-class, efficient agency machine in this time and planning for forward, there's a great resource here at resonate.com forward slash adventures um and adventures and if you um, are just looking for general information there's a ton of research available that we've got for free 
at resonate.com resources, um, forward slash resources. But I think now we're going to take on some of those great questions. So I'm going to turn it back over to Stuart. Uh, thank you, Erica. And, and thank you, Angela, for sharing all these insights. Uh, the questions are coming in fast and furious. So uh, we're going to, in just a couple of minutes, we're going to start taking some audience questions. Uh, I do want to invite uh, our audience here, uh, again, if you do have a question uh, for our speakers, uh, just simply use the question tool that you see there on the left side of your screen. I'm going to get to as many audience questions as we can. Uh, some quick reminders. Uh, we had a few people asking about both of these things. First off, if you want to get a copy of today's slides, and you know, a lot of fine print in there, uh, a lot of things we probably want to want to go over later on. Uh, you can download a PDF of the slides right now from the event resources tab that you see up there at the top of your screen. So feel free to go on in there and do that. Share those with your colleagues as well. Uh, also, uh, today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on demand. Uh, we're going to send, <coughs> excuse me, a, a link to that on demand version uh, over to everyone oh, in, in about about 3.30 Eastern time today. So uh, just keep your eyes out for that. And again, certainly feel free to share that with your colleagues uh, or better yet, have them register now. We'll send them that link directly uh, once it is live. All right. So let's get into some of these questions. Uh, and I'm sure we, we've got lots of stuff to cover here. Uh, so, so Angela, let's just, you know, sort of start off, uh, you know, with, with one for you sort of in general. And uh, this is really a lot of people, you know, sort of asking this. And that is, you know, um, sort of in, in terms of like defining ethnicity parameters. Well, actually, as, as you approach, you know, as, as you're approaching actually the, uh, the Hispanic audience, look, there are so many segments of the Hispanic audience. Uh, so many different areas that people look at. Um, how do you sort of cover everything within these segments without, um, I guess for lack of a better term, you know, w w without ignoring some of the, uh, it, you know, sub-segments sub that are really ultimately important to everyone? So can you sort of give a, you know, maybe maybe just sort of the, the quick approach here to to understanding this audience? Uh, and, and, of course, why you're looking at it really more from a behavioral point of view than, uh, as everyone seems to have always sort of typically looked at multicultural from an ethnicity point of view. So it's a little bit of a complex question, and we typically like to present this in about an hour so we can go deep. Um, I think that the... uh, I, I, I got all day. I don't know about, you know, uh, obviously we need, the, we, we, we need the, the, the Reader's Digest version of this one. Yeah. yeah. The, our focus has been on understanding identity first. How Hispanic do people feel? And what are the driving values behind decision making? Once we've clustered people into like kind of three big segments, within that we can further cluster people and further look at different dimensions. Are they Mexican American? Can we look at them on a regional basis? Can we look at them um, if they're young, right? Can we do intersectional Hispanics? Can we look at LGBTQ Hispanics? There's a lot of facets of identity that we take into um, account when we consider this, but the first thing is that identity. How Hispanic do they feel? And in what moments do they feel Hispanic, right? There are people kind of on the spectrum of, of Hispanicity every day, and in their decision making, um, they might differ. I had a client actually just yesterday who's in the food space ask me if they should just ignore American embracers because their food product is so um, traditional and authentic. And I said, on the contrary, this American embracer who might believe and behave um, in ways that look very American in many moments, when it comes to food, he may want something that feels very much like what their mom made, right? So it's really about understanding the category, the moment, where in the journey they are, and then going deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, so Angela, just, just to follow up, because uh, another question just came in very similar again, this idea of um, you know, being culturally driven and not language driven. Uh, you know, traditionally, so many brands have, uh, you know, targeted the Hispanic audience by taking their ads and translating them into Spanish. Um, we, we know that that maybe that doesn't work, but can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how, 
how do you ultimately, when working with clients, even overcome this with them uh, as, as that approach seems to so sort of uh, get stuck with a lot of people? Yeah. Well, language is, in our mind, a tactic, right? First, we need to know what we're going to say to people and how we're going to say it. What's the most persuasive thing we could say? And for Hispanics, often the most persuasive thing we can say is really rooted in, in a, a value or a belief. I'm trying to think of, of an easy example. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to language, that gets to media, right? If we know what we want to say, then we can think about where we want to say it. And for some Hispanics, the easy, obvious answer we can get to reach very easily, we can get to frequency very easily, is being in Spanish on Spanish language networks. But we know if you really want to connect and be meaningful to people, you've got to get, have that resonance. And that resonance sometimes comes from being the right partner in English on the right uh, platform. So if it's a Me Too or a Jamescla, or if it's being adjacent to the New York Times article on Bad Bunny two days ago, right? Mm -hmm. So where I got some really targeted ads, I might point out, uh, over, over the, the last couple nights that I've been reading it, they know who I am, and they found me reading this uh, content that resonates with me, and they've got the right message in front of me. So, so understanding that balance between what is the content that I'm looking at, how does my culture influence my decision making, and then putting the right message in front of us. And that's something that um, helps us, we can do better when we create the better audiences um, inside of Resonate. Great. Thank you. Uh, er <laughs> uh, Erica, let me, you know, look, a, a lot of questions coming in here, sort of trying to understand a little bit more about Resonate uh, and how this goes on. So but I'm going to start off with one, but I'm going to follow up with it with a second. The first off, uh, look, obviously today, as we looked at multicultural insights, we were, we were focused on the Hispanic or Latinx market. Uh, but uh, with other multicultural segments, uh, do you see people using Resonate as they are doing that? Uh, again, questions about Asian American, about African American, about all other, uh, you know, subsegments that way. So yes, we we ask, we have, um, you know, all the category, you know, categorical, you could you could think of. I think we we ask, and people are telling us, of course, you know, how they are falling into those cultural backgrounds. So if you're looking for information about Black Americans. Um, you know, and even subsets, right, of, of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. we, we have that for many cultural and nationalities. Got it. Uh, and, and then uh, the next one, which, again, uh, everyone trying to sort of understand, uh, you know, how this sort of segmentation works and building out different segments within the platform for campaigns. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how people are using it, how granular you can get with segments and audiences, uh, and things like that. Again, I, I'm sure that that's, that's your hour-long presentation coming up, but uh, if we can get the, uh, again, your Reader's Digest version of that. <laughs> of course. So I think, <laughs> look, it, you know, especially, you know, brands, uh, and would, sometimes they would keep segments that they would have. Maybe it would be like a two years. Every two years they'd revisit their segmentation strategy, right? And and so it would be this big, expensive study, and, and, and you would get a binder and put the binder aside, and you maybe have a typing tool for it. What what we're what we're able to do is really you know either recre we recreate those segments so you can take the segments that you know and love and build them out in the platform and the way I like to think about it is you have that segment you understand them let's say they're your your high value um, you know high high spend shoppers right um, and those folks you know them in their experience with you you know when they shop with you and you know how much they spend with you maybe they use your you know store credit card right you have a loyalty program. That gives you a lot of information about them, and, and surely you match that with other data. But what you don't always know is what you know. Are they also Amazon Prime shoppers? And and what categories do they shop at Amazon Prime? And when do they shop at Amazon versus the Costco versus your store, right? And and so when you build those segments again in the platform, now you're choosing from all of the data that you already know and and their relationship with you. And you can even onboard, you know, you can onboard your loyalty program and make it very rich. But now you can add in things, you know, all of the things we've talked about today. How are they responding to the pandemic? Um, you know, how do they feel about, um, you know, what's happening with Black Lives Matter? I mean, we can get down to that level of detail. Do they care about companies that want, that support the environment? Are they, are they about sustainability? Or are they about other things, right? So you can layer all those things on. And then I think one thing that we've talked a little bit about that, that is another really, really critical thing, and you could talk an hour about it, is 
you know, people's values. And so you heard Angela mention some of the differences in people's values. You saw me mention maybe a little bit of the difference in people's values, but values are really what makes the individual, you know, at the core different. And, it, and the values are what establishes how they're going to respond to your creative or how they're, what kind of decision making they're going to do. And so that's where now you can take the segmentation and add in values, right? Add in their motivations, add in how they feel about your competitors. And so all of that together is really, really important. And that's where your segmentation lives and breathes. Now, I'm, one more quick thought on it is now what we find, and we have CPG companies that are, that are very, um, you know, who have their segments and they know them very well. And perhaps for, you know, we have one CPG that for their, one of their brands, they were like hundred percent sure that this is their you know, primary segment. And when we were able to onboard their website data, um, what we actually discovered was new, a new segment. And so it's not just the on the go millennials, but it's also the, um, you know, boomers who are nostalgic for your brand. Right. And so we can often discover new segments by, um, you know, tagging your media or tagging your website, right. And being able to pull that data into the platform. So I think your, your segmentation can't be an old study that you used to do and, and, you know, and you invested in, then you, and you held on to it for years. It's gotta be dynamic. And it has to be micro segments. Like you really want these very granular refined segments. And I think, you know, Angela's examples give you a, a perfect way of, of accessing that type of um, like segmentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so simply put, uh, in dem demographics are outdated or demographics are dead uh, that you really need to, you know, look, start looking at, uh, again, behaviors, emotions. Uh, all the things as we go into a world of experience that we, that we need to really be paying attention to. Um, is, is that a, a brief version? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, good. Uh, which, which is the next question, I guess, um, you know, it, Angela, over, you know, in, in terms of multicultural, um, again, you know, I think we, we've talked a little bit about this, but, um, you know, do, do you really need to, I mean, again, is, is it, if, if we're looking multicultural and we're doing it in terms of understanding beliefs and values and um, behaviors and things like that, does the multicultural aspect still hold true? Or is it, um, again, we're looking at within sub-segments there as, as, as we ultimately examine those behaviors? Absolutely. I think behaviors is just one piece of it. Whether it's multicultural or a segment of mothers, you need to understand why people are making the decisions that they're making. And sometimes we get so caught up in all the data that we forget that why is really important. And when you can layer in both the behavioral and some consumer understanding as to why the decisions are being made, that's when you get the real richness. And, and it's really why we as a agency that, that doesn't do very much media have found so much value and resonate because we're able to do that combination and get uh, a richness mm -hmm. we can't elsewhere. Great, thank you. Um, we got time for another question here uh, before we sum up. And so, Erica, can we talk a little bit? Look, um, as as we're approaching things multiculturally, uh, I think there's also the sense of that there's a certain amount of targeting limitation, uh, particularly on social, right? Via Facebook or or programmatic, with not being able to directly target by ethnicity. So, uh, particularly on Facebook, how do you any, any tips on on how you can ultimately overcome some of those limitations? Yeah, so I think it's certainly gotten challenging in the landscape for a variety of, of targeting. And I think one of the biggest challenges that people have is they develop, when they develop these beautiful, rich, like micro segments, and they truly understand this audience, they go to execute across channels and it's, they have to recreate their audiences. So essentially create proxies for this beautiful segment that you've built and you understood and you crafted, you know, perfect offer for. And so that's really, you know, the, one of the, one of the things that we, you know, the reasons why we built the platform and didn't just, you know, produce data is that when you uh, create these audiences inside of resonate, you can actually immediately activate these audiences. So you can take this audience, and ship it to your DSP, you know, and, and execute. We've got our, you know, partner relationships with, with all of the major um, providers as well as, you know, through your, either through your agency or brand direct, you can easily actually execute those segments. And so in that, you don't have to try to recreate the segment. So you're not trying to build another 
segment that looks just like it, where you're targeting people based on their language, right, and, or trying to use filters or, or criteria that's inside of base Facebook or anywhere else, you can actually take that audience and ship it out. And so we're giving you all of that data. Um, it's not, this is not just theoretical, like, data. This is data about real people, and these are real audiences. And um, you can you can actually act, activate them directly um, through your channel directly through a, through an agency directly through a DSP or a DMT however you need to execute and so that's one way you can go from insights into action really quickly and I think I, I think there's a lot of questions about that but that's really the best way to do it is to know those people not to try to categorize people you know with a language um, filter so um, that's how we do it anyway it resonates great well. Thank you, Erica. Uh, and we are fast approaching the end of our time here. So, uh, again, uh, Angela Rodriguez from Alma, uh, Erica McCoy from our sponsor today, Resonate. I want to thank you both for, again, sharing all these insights and also uh, for taking some time to answer some audience questions. Uh, again, great, great topic. Uh, I feel like we could go on all day on this. Uh, but, again, uh, I want to just share some, some final reminders here to our audience uh, again. Uh, I've popped up the uh, uh, ways to learn more here about Resonate, so uh, that's up on your screen. Uh, go visit them. Uh, they're our sponsor today. Uh, if you want a copy of the slide deck, you'll find it right now, event resources, top of your screen. Uh, also, check your email, 3.30. We're going to send you that link to the on-demand recording. Uh, lastly, uh, adweek.com slash webinars, our webinar calendar. See what we've got coming up. Sign up for an upcoming uh, webinar. Uh, Resonate's going to be doing one next Tuesday as well, so uh, a little bit of a different take uh, than today's, but uh, definitely something worth checking out. Uh, but see what else is out there. Uh, we're updating that calendar as often as Resonate seems to be updating uh, their research these days. So, so every day uh, we're adding stuff. So see, see what's there, sign up for something. Uh, so again, I want to thank our sponsor, Resonate, and our, uh, and our speakers today. I want to thank our audience for taking time out of your busy day. And we look forward to seeing everyone at an upcoming Ad Week webinar. <laughs>